Here. You launched a new magazine, the Journal of Alta California, which will be going out four times a year. Why launch a magazine now in this environment? <laughs> well, I think when you're uh, starting a new business venture, particularly something in the area of culture and the arts, uh, you don't want to be in a super crowded field. So I think announcing a new blog or a new website, we would have been lost. Whereas a publication, you know, it has a certain permanence. It's quarterly, so we don't really have to keep up with news. We kind of reflect on things that are happening. I was more modeling what we're doing on like the New York Review of Books, maybe a little bit of Vanity Fair, maybe a little bit of the New Yorker, but they come out much more often, so they have to stay kind of closer to the news. Whereas we're interested in things that last for a longer time, culture, uh, politics, technology, trends, larger scale movements. And we just thought print would be an easy way to do it. And nowadays a print publication is mostly electronic anyway. I mean, all of the editors work in different places. The copy comes in electronically, it's assembled. You know, the printing is just the last step in a process. So we're very ready to do, do uh, anything that we're doing in the magazine online almost uh, simultaneously. So what do you think then is the fate of the magazine business as budgets are getting cut, people are getting laid off, can, you know, magazines are being canceled? Well, it depends on what you're doing. You know, if you really want to do a mass pop magazine, I think it's very difficult because that audience has moved largely to the web. But if you have a very focused audience and you're really delivering something of value to them, think of a magazine like The Economist. I don't see that as a failing business. Mm. The New York Times has had a giant surge in attention because of the interest in politics. The Washington Post, I remember when Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, most publishers were thinking, well, he's got some secret technological idea, something to do with molecules or transistors <laughs> or something. And Jeff Bezos had an unusual idea, run it like a newspaper, report the news, get it straight. Underneath the nose of the Washington Post is Washington and mm. politics. The Washington Post newspaper in the old days, sort of wanted to be the New York Times. So they were opening biz, uh, bureaus in Singapore and trying to cover the world, and they were a little bit disdainful of something as greasy as politics. And under Bezos, they're just covering what's right under their nose. You know, the LA paper should cover Hollywood, the Washington paper should cover politics, San Francisco should cover technology. If you're not covering what's under your nose and trying to be somebody else, then you're entering a crowded field. What do you think of Radhika Jones as the new head of Vanity Fair? Well, I, it's, it's an interesting choice, and it's a kind of a literary choice, I think, a book choice rather than a pop culture choice. So I'd be interested to see uh, what happens there. But I suspect they will continue to have very good writing, very good photography, and maybe a little more culture and a little less politics. But that's just a guess. Mm. It, well, Graydon Carter obviously took a very very strong stance against President Trump. So you wonder, you know, what voice she'll bring to the political And Graydon scene. had great instincts about what's happening and what people are talking about and how to mine old criminal cases and how to, mo uh, you know, modern stories and meld them into a very unique combination. But I think my guess is that Graydon himself felt like things are going to be changing. I don't know if I want to be part of that change. Let somebody else have a chance. Right. Budgets are getting cut. You know, maybe the, the, the big glossy pages, maybe the, those won't survive. We don't know. Well, what would your advice and to there her were, be? There were also uh, lifestyle issues uh -huh. in the Condé Nast organization. You know, great uh, black cars for everybody, fancy restaurants. The Hearst Company's in the magazine business, too, and we run a little more of a business-like operation. And I think that's where Condé Nast will trend because they have to. It's a business reality. So what would your advice to Radhika Jones be? My advice would be, and I hate to give it away because it's advice I want to give to myself, but I think uh, arts and culture are very enduring interest areas. There are more people going to museums and ballets and symphonies than go to sporting events in San Francisco and in New York. So there's a very deep vein of interest. I mean, why do people who work in Silicon Valley want to live in San Francisco? It's not because Stanford is here. It's not because Hewlett Packard was founded here. It's because of restaurants, arts, culture, museums, hospitals, the whole texture of a city. And I think that's a part of life, and that's the part that our uh, magazine is addressed to. So we've been talking a lot about digital platforms and their responsibility in the age of fake news. Yeah. What do you think is the responsibility of Facebook Well, I, I and hate Google the term fake news Twitter? because I think, you know, news is news. Fake news is made up stuff. What I Fake think, stories. Yeah, I, I, that, what, what bothers, I, I think the terminology is wrong. I think what, what I, I'm, I don't, I don't believe, better? I don't believe in the Trump terminology. Mm -hmm. I believe that there's opinion and commentary, which is very uh, 
much what modern news has become. Right. People sitting in a studio discussing things as opposed to reporters going out and covering the news. But some of this quote unquote news is actually inaccurate. Yeah. You know, and so, when it comes and, and down so, to like some how many people were inaccurate. killed in the shooting or I who know. did it. Well so those things have to be right. And mm -hmm. and if it's not accurate it's not news, it's opinion. An opinion can be wrong, opinion can be interesting, it can be boring, but it's a completely different genre. And so if you let everybody's opinion be the same, then you're in the commentary business. But news is a business where you have to spell people's names right, you have to get the facts right, or you get fired. That's the news business. So what is the responsibility of, let's say, Facebook? Well, I, I think you have to pick. You know, every business has, a, has an opinion. You can say, we are a commentary business, and we're very good at it, and let's specialize at that. Or you can say, we're a news business, like what Bezos has done with The Post. They say they're a tech business, not a media business. Well, is, is that absolving the, I, I, I think that's another kind of a dodge of vocabulary. They are a tech business, and they're a much better tech business than most media companies are. But media companies are much better at gathering news than <laughs> Facebook is uh, and that, that you know there, there are sort of natural business boundaries between tech but but the thing that I think has gotten Facebook and others in trouble is they're selling advertising mm -hmm. and once you sell advertising then you have a very different you play by a different set of rules so you've got the commentary but Fox is mostly commentary and sells advertising mm -hmm. let's say but they have to account for where these ads come from and they have to report in certain ways because they're taking political ads so I think if you added transparency, then Facebook can decide to be a news organization or be a commentary organization, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But in the zone of advertising, you have to play by those rules.